The conducting zone is the topic of the screencast. You may find information on the conducting zone in chapter 13 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the functions of the respiratory zone. Describe the structure and function of the following. Respiratory epithelium, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, trachea, pharynx, larynx, bronchi, and bronchioles. The conducting zone is the portion of the respiratory system that does not directly participate in gas exchange, that is the movement of gases into and out of the pulmonary capillaries. However, the conducting zone has some very important functions. First of all, the conducting zone allows for air to move into the lungs and also from the lungs during pulmonary ventilation. The air is filtered and cleansed of dust particles, bacteria, mold spores, viruses, substances in the air that could potentially harm the lungs. And the air is also warmed and moistened as it makes its way to the lungs. So during inhalation, the conducting zone conditions the air on its way to the lungs so that there is not excessive loss of heat or moisture during pulmonary ventilation. By filtering the air, there is also reduction in the risk of damage to the lungs due to particulate matter or infectious organisms, such as bacteria or viruses. We will now discuss the conducting zone following the path that air would take toward the lungs. We will start with the nasal cavity. We will then move to the pharynx, then the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and then we will end in the terminal bronchioles. Most of the conducting zone is covered by ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And if you recall, we looked at this tissue under the microscope in the tissues lab at the beginning of the semester. Numerous goblet cells secrete mucus. This mucus helps humidify the passing air, and it also helps trap particles and microbes that otherwise might reach the lungs. Cilia moves the mucus and trap particles toward the pharynx. There, the mucus is either swallowed or spat out. Notice that cilia in the nasal cavity beat downward toward the pharynx, and cilia in the lower respiratory tract beat upwards toward the pharynx. The nose is the only part of the respiratory system that is visible externally from outside of the body. Air enters the nose through external nares or nostrils and then enters the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity is divided into a right and left by the nasal septum. If you recall, the nasal septum consists of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, the vomer, and septal cartilage. The nasal cavity is separated from the oral cavity by the hard and soft palates. The hard palate is the anterior structure and is composed of bone. The soft palate is the posterior structure and it is composed of soft tissue. Olfactory receptors are located at the most superior portion of the nasal cavity. The olfactory receptors detect molecules that embed themselves in the mucus layer and in response send action potentials to the olfactory bulb and then the brain. The detection of these molecules by the olfactory receptors is responsible for our sense of smell. Because these olfactory receptors are only located in the superior portion of the nasal cavity, when we want to smell something, such as perfume or a rose, we sniff very vigorously to make sure that the molecules make it to the olfactory receptors. The remainder of the nasal cavity is lined with respiratory mucosa for moistening the air and also trapping incoming particles.
the lateral walls of the nasal cavity have these projections called nasal concave. And the purpose of these nasal concave are to increase the surface area of the mucosa and to increase the air turbulence within the nasal cavity. And what do I mean by increase air tur turbulence? To cause the air to bounce around quite a bit in the nasal cavity, interacting with the mucous membrane. Remember that the conducting zone serves to help moisten and warm and cleanse the air on its journey to the lungs. So the more interaction that you can have with the air and the mucous membrane, uh, the greater its effectiveness in warming, moistening, and cleansing the air. The paranasal sinuses are cavities within bones of the skull that are lined with respiratory membrane, and they're connected to the nasal cavity through small openings. Para means beside, so these are the sinuses that are beside the nasal cavity. They function to lighten the skull, they also act as resonance chambers for speech, and they also help warm and moisten incoming air. Air moves through the nasal cavity and then exits the nasal cavity to enter the pharynx. The pharynx is a muscular tube lined with mucosa that extends from the nasal cavity all the way to the esophagus and larynx. The pharynx is subdivided into three regions. The nasopharynx is directly posterior to the nasal cavity. It is lined specifically with respiratory epithelia and is exclusively part of the respiratory system. A mass of lymphatic tissue found in the nasopharynx is called the pharyngeal tonsils. You may know them as the adenoids. The portion of the pharynx that is directly posterior to the oral cavity is the oral pharynx, and the portion directly posterior to the larynx and just superior to the esophagus is the laryngopharynx. The oral pharynx and laryngopharynx are both part of the respiratory system as well as the digestive system because they serve as common pathways for food as well as air. Air that enters the pharynx from the nasal cavity quickly exits the pharynx and enters the larynx. The larynx is the opening to the trachea. It's also called your voice box. The larynx is composed of cartilage, skeletal muscles, and ligaments. It functions to conduct air to and from the lungs, also to divert food to the esophagus and air to the trachea, and also to produce sounds for speech. Again, the larynx is also called your voice box. This figure from your book shows the larynx and the trachea Again, the larynx is the opening to the trachea. The larynx is surrounded and protected by several rings of cartilage, the largest being the thyroid cartilage. The thyroid cartilage is often referred to as the Adam's apple, probably because in some men it is very narrow and can be seen protruding from the neck. The cricoid cartilage is the most inferior ring of the larynx. The epiglottis is a spoon-shaped structure composed of elastic cartilage. It extends from the larynx and base of the tongue into the laryngopharynx and helps root food into the esophagus and air into the larynx. If you were to look down upon the larynx from this direction, you would see the following. This is a superior view of a cross section of the larynx. Notice the vocal folds or true vocal cords shown in white. As air passes through the larynx, the vocal folds vibrate to produce sound. The pitch produced by the vocal folds can be altered by 
the contraction of voluntary skeletal muscles on the vocal folds, which change the tension on the folds, therefore altering the pitch. Pitch can also be changed by varying the distance between the vocal folds. Men tend to have deeper voices due to the effect of testosterone, which makes the vocal folds thicker. The trachea extends from the larynx in the neck down into the thoracic cavity behind the sternum into the mediastinum located between the lungs. The trachea is lined with respiratory epithelium, so there are ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue lining the trachea as particles and bacteria, viruses, etc. get stuck in the mucus. The cilia moves that mucus with all the little nasties away from the lungs back toward the pharynx where either it's spat out or swallowed. People who smoke uh, lose that ciliated lining and so mucus will tend to accumulate in the lungs. For this reason, people who smoke, uh, it is recommended that they not use cough suppressants because that really is their only means of voiding the lower respiratory tract of mucus. Alcohol also tends to destroy the ciliated lining of the trachea as well, so this can also be a problem with chronic alcoholics. The middle layer of the trachea consists of C-shaped rings of cartilage. The cartilage being somewhat flexible but also somewhat rigid ensures that there is an open airway. It is C-shaped because the esophagus is posterior to the trachea and to ensure that a bolus of food which is swallowed can pass unobstructed down the esophagus, we have a trachealis muscle that can relax and allow food to pass. The trachea branches into a left and right primary bronchus. Other terms include main as well as main stem. Uh, any of those terms you are free to use to describe these bronchi. Anyway, the right bronchus is larger and steeper than the left and the clinical significance of this is if an object is aspirated into the trachea uh, that is if a food item somehow makes it into the trachea like a peanut typically it moves into the right bronchus as opposed to the left the trachea branches into a left and right primary bronchus, the primary bronchi branch into secondary bronchi, the secondary bronchi branch into tertiary bronchi, and the tertiary bronchi give rise to bronchioles, specifically terminal bronchioles, which represent the end of the conduction zone. This branching resembles a tree, and for that reason, they are collectively referred to as a bronchial tree. As the bronchi become smaller, the column-shaped, pseudostratified, ciliated cells are replaced with cuboidal cells, and the cuboidal cells have no cilia. Also, there are a few goblet cells, so there is less production of mucus and the rings of cartilage become thinner and thinner until they are completely absent in the bronchioles. Bronchioles are much smaller than bronchi, uh, less than one millimeter. They contain no cartilage. They also contain a very large amount of smooth muscle. The smooth muscle allows the bronchioles to dilate as the smooth muscle relaxes and constrict as the smooth muscle contracts. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the functions of the respiratory zone. Describe the structure and function of the following. Respiratory epithelium, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, trachea, pharynx, larynx, bronchi, and bronchioles.
Blood flow and blood pressure is the topic of the next screencast.